guys, we're going to get going through reintroducing supply and demand three. This is a little different style of class today. I'm going to have you guys engaged with me to try and learn something. You're going to be up. You're going to be active. You're not going to be taking a whole ton of notes. Uh, but at the start, we're going to try and introduce what we want to talk about. I'm hoping you did your post-class reading from last time and you saw the uh, assumptions of the supply and demand model. Notice there was like chapter one in your book and it's all like, what is microeconomics? What are we doing here? And then chapter two of your book starts off and it's like, we have this thing called supply and demand and they have like a page on that. And then the very first thing where they're really getting into anything is the assumptions of the supply and demand model. Okay, so it's right start and center in your textbook as to in terms of what we're gonna do. I'm gonna slightly add to uh, what you guys had in your textbook. These assumptions are of the supply and demand model or sometimes the perfect competition model, all that stuff. It's funny because everybody knows that these exist and everybody calls them different things or has like different versions of this if you look through all these different textbooks. So I wanna add one more into your textbook, but I'm gonna quickly go through them. You should have had them as post-class work. Uh, but then what we're going to do is we're going to run a little experiment and we're going to see how important these assumptions are to our outcomes. All right. So first thing we're going to do with this experimental is go through those assumptions. The assumptions that were in your book, the very first one is that we have a single market. That's kind of a weird one. It's not usually listed this way, but I get what your, your book is getting at here. Other times this is basically listed as, hey, no such thing as externalities, right? Your book doesn't want to say it yet because... It hasn't covered externalities yet, right? But you're assumed to have had principles of micro. So the idea here of only, we're only looking at a single market. We're not looking at general equilibrium effects where you have like, hey, this good, you know, whatever happened to this good might happen to another good. There's no externalities, no, nothing else. So for instance, in our hypothetical market for demand, I said, hey, I have six beers that I have to hand out. And we just looked at, if I hand these beers out, do you value them and what's your value versus like what the supplier's cost would be basically? Like how do I hand them out to the highest possible value? We didn't think, oh, if I hand out three beers to Batman, he might hop in the Batmobile and get, you know, go drunk driving and like kill somebody, right? That would be like a spillover effect on something else. We didn't count that in our, you have the highest possible value, right? Like we never said, <laughs> We got the highest possible value here, but we really kind of screwed up something over here. We didn't talk about that at all. We have a single market, okay? Another thing you read was the second idea is that we have a homogenous good. From the perspective of the people in the market, the good that they are consuming is considered equivalent, right? We consider it a homogenous good if the consumers all view it as the same thing. It doesn't matter what you think, it depends on what the consumer thinks. So like, Gasoline for a lot of you guys is probably a homogenous good. You don't care if you get it from mobile or if you get it from shell, right? Now, a couple of you might like have fallen into the marketing and been like, no, shell's got the oxygenation, you know, whatever, and it's better gas. Okay, fine, whatever it is. But for most of you, it's a homogenous good. Or the typical example would be uh, like wheat. Wheat is wheat is wheat, right? You can get it from any farm that's out there. You go, well, what about organic wheat? Okay, that's something different then, right? That's not a part of our market. It has to be seen as equivalent. The third one is the big one. Your book doesn't really emphasize. It just has this one little line on it, but it's this idea that it, we have perfect information. Everyone knows all, of, all the demanders know all of their values and they know every other demander's values. And everyone, including demanders, knows all of the supplier's costs. So we know all the demand schedules, all the supply schedules. We know everything when we're engaging in this market with this homogenous good in this single market, right? We, everyone knows that everyone knows, right? Everyone knows that everyone knows everything. So all information is known by all. We have perfect information. The fourth assumption is that we have a large number of buyers and sellers. The idea here is that no single person has a big influence over the market. Right, so when I go to the grocery store and I buy some light cereal, that's not like an increase in demand that will change the price of the market, right? I'm a very small fish in a very large pond, okay? So we have these large numbers of buyers and sellers. And then the last assumption is not in your book, although it's kind of utilized in your book in the background, and I'm gonna kind of add it in here, is that we're assuming zero transaction costs. We're assuming that there can be entry and exit between firms and consumers 
very costlessly, right? So a lot of models showcase this idea of zero transaction costs, that entry and exit are costless. And so those would be our five assumptions, all right? So theoretically, you've already done this. And I just quickly reviewed them for you uh, with just the addition of the last one, zero transaction costs here. Cool? All right. Let's do our little experiment that we're going to have here. So this is going to be kind of hodgepodge, and I'm going to do it on purpose that way. I'm going to kind of go by the seat of my pants. You're going to have to be up, paying attention, and going with me, because I think it helps us understand what's happening here a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run what's called a double auction experiment. All of you are going to be involved, and you are going to have either values in front of you or uh, costs in front of you, and we are going to basically do a supply and demand market, okay? So I have roughly 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 22, 24, 26. I have roughly like 28. So I'm going to need 14 on each side. So I want all of you guys, what you're going to do in just a minute, is you're all going to come up over here, and then you're going to come up to me one at a time, and I'm going to hand you two sticky notes. All right, so I'm going to hand you two sticky notes. For some of you, I'm going to ask you what number you want, 3 through 12. So you can't pick a number anywhere other than 3 through 12. Others of you, I'm just going to hand it to you. Okay, so you're going to get two sticky notes that are up there, right? And then you're going to go back to your seat, and then we'll do this double auction experiment, okay? So I'm going to try and do it as fast as I can. So everybody up over there. And I need somebody to count to where the 14th person is in line. Come on up. Not the first person, because you got to come on through. So once you're done with 14, tell me. So the next person, tell me. What number you want? Three through 12. <laughs> I forgot already. <laughs> What number do you want uh, for your second one? Oh, three through 12. Uh, pick number. Pick another number. <laughs> Pick another number. Four. Twenty-six, though. Okay. It'll work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I said. Pick another number. <laughs> Where is my cutoff? He's 14. He's 14 at the time. Okay. Pick two numbers. Uh, well, then. We're going to go home, huh? I'm going to have you switch over here. Okay, just so we're Get that off one. Yeah. <laughs> get that for me.
me see. Pick an upper. Pick a number. Pick a number. <laughs> Seven. Pick another number. Um, eight. Hey, there is no way that I gamed the system and like knew what numbers you were putting down, correct? There was enough people out there that verified I asked you a number and I just wrote it down, correct? Right? Like I didn't have some magic trick where it's like, oh, every other, there's nothing there, right? There's nothing I could have done to control what got out there, all right? Now, what you guys have in front of you. This is like the big reveal. This is like the important thing is what color you got here. Because what you have, if you are a pink individual, you're a consumer and those are your values. So you want high numbers. So there's some of you out there that have very high numbers as a consumer out there and you're loving life right now. That is your value of the first good is your highest value. And the second highest one you have is the value of your second good that you have out there. You are going to try and purchase goods and get as much additional value or surplus from your exchange as you can. What you're gonna do is you're gonna keep track of things. So if you have a value of 12 in front of you and you buy something for seven, you just made five, okay? And you're gonna keep track of that additional five that you got, okay? So you're gonna say, oh, I made $5 off of that exchange, right? It's like if I went to Walmart and I said, walking in, how much would I pay for a box of life cereal right now? and I had six in front of me and I walk into Walmart and I see the price is three, I just made $3 worth of surplus. So I, I won three on that exchange. Like, so I made three here, right? That's what we're going to track, okay? So for pink, you guys are demanders, you're consumers that are out there, okay? You guys, the highest value one you're going to use first. That is part of the rule here that you just have to use the highest value one first. All I'm basically doing is giving you rules that are the rule of rational life. You would never walk in and make the exchange with your lower value first and then go, oh, well now, you know, I made one instead of seven. Like you wouldn't do that, okay? So it's very simple. You may have assumed now, if you're on the yellow side, what you are, you are the suppliers and you want low numbers. So you want really low numbers. Those are your costs of making the goods in this market, the homogenous good that we have. Okay, so those are your costs. You're going to sell your lower cost item first. So if you have a one and, or sorry, a three and a six, right? Then you're going to sell the three first. That was your lower cost one. It allows you to get the most surplus out of the first exchange. Okay, so everybody's good with their supplier or their demander and what we have going on here, costs versus values, right? Okay, what we're gonna do is we are going to have an auction, a double auction, which means I am going to call things out I am going to, on the board, basically have what are called asks or bids, and I am going to write them down. A bid is what a demander is bidding to purchase something. So a demander might say, hey, I'm willing to bid, uh, let's say $5. I will write that down, and that bid is live for anyone uh, to either beat as another demander. So if you want to, as a demander, say, I'd offer up more than that. I'll do 550. You raise your hand and you say 550, bid, bid 550, and I'll do this. This offer is now off the table. There's only one that's live. The best one is live. Suppliers can jump in and say, hey, 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 me, me, me. I would sell, I'm asking 
you know, $11 for the item. And I'll write down $11. These are both live as we go. If you would ever like to accept one of the other side, so let's say that you are a supplier and this demand of 550 is like, yep, I'll do that transaction. I'll trade with you. What you do is instead of you raising your hand and offering another bid, is you raise both hands. The first person that I see that raises both hands, you have made that transaction. So once you've made that transaction, I will say, oh, hey, we made this transaction here at 550. He raised both his hands and got it. And this was the person that put in the bid. You guys can now take whatever your costs and values are, subtract them from 550 and kind of write them down somewhere else, right? So like if I buy something for five um, and I valued it at seven, I would write down, hey, I need two on this one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to my next card that I have, right? So as a supplier, uh, suppliers are yellow, right? He has a three and a nine. He's going to try and sell his three first. And then once he sells his three, he's going to try and find a way to exchange his nine for some gain. The more gain he can get, the better off it is. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to go through like a trial run that doesn't count. I'm going to do like one or two of these so that we see how it works. Because I think you learn best by doing and you'll see what questions you have. And then once we're rec field ready, we're going to do the actual auction and we're going to see where we come in. And you have the chance to win whatever these represent. All right. But it might be worth it to you. Any questions up front on this before we do the practice run? Yeah. Oh, nope. All right. So I'm going to ask for you guys to just jump in and offer bids. So as a demander, what is your bid? How much are you willing to pay? Or asks. So you're just going to raise your hand and I'm going to call on you guys. Yep. Can we raise our own bid? Yes. Yep. If you did 550, you can go up to six if you want. Nobody's biting on it. Yep. Go ahead. Three. Bid? Yeah. I'll ask 11. <laughs> I'll ask seven. I'll bid eight. So you'll take this then? Yeah. Yes. So you want it at seven. So you'll get it at seven because it was offered up there. I won't let it, I won't let you overdo it any, right? So that would be an exchange. So theoretically, uh, you had eight. As a demander, so your value is eight, right? And the cost of it to him was seven. So he would write down like a one on the side, like, hey, I just made a dollar there, right? And then who made the exchange? Did you? And you had it at four and it was seven. So you'd write down a three, right? His costs were four and he sold it for seven. So he'd write down a three. Let's keep going just so you get, get the feel of it. This is not real. We're not going to write it down yet. We're just kind of getting through it to make sure. Yeah. I ask none. So now I would start in a new. Kind of column here, and this is now what's live. And he took it. I was the first double hand that I saw. So this would be the exchange with him. They would calculate their differences, write them down to the side, and they'd move on to their second card. Everybody gets it? Questions? All right, let's do this, folks. Here we go. All right. Any bids, any ask? Yep. Oh, no questions. Hold on. Yep. You can you only ask and bid things that you have, or can you do anything? You cannot make an, a, a transaction where you lose money. Okay. So if you have, uh, I always get confused with the colors because I did different colors earlier. The pink, you're a demander. Say you value it at $3. You can't say six because you're losing $3 if that transaction goes through. And let's pretend it's $3 million. You would never do that. So we're just, I'm just asking you to follow the rule of rational life. You can't bid above your values. You can't uh, ask below your, cost. below your cost. You can't say, oh, I would sell it below my cost, right? I can't say my cost is four, I'll sell it for two. You do not have to exchange both items, right? So that's where that would come in. You're better off not making an exchange that hurts you. And I'm not gonna let you make an exchange that hurts you, hopefully, right? You will follow that rule, right? So sellers, you can't sell for $2 if your cost is four. Buyers, you can't bid $8 if your value is two. 
right? You can't go beyond what yours is. So you might not exchange both of them, no promises. Okay, but you have to do buyers, you have to do your highest value first, sellers, you have to do your lower cost first. Good. All right, let's go. Bids and asks. Yep. Ask mine. Who was that? I didn't even ask mine. He just jumped in, gets aggressive. Bids. Yep. I'm going with her. I'm going hands. Eight. Six. I'm not. I'm not doing places. I gotta see it. Yep. Six. He took it. He was the first one I saw to take it. So we have a transaction for six right there between you two. We're on to a new exchange. All right, new ones. Yep. Seven. Thank you, Cyril. <laughs> I saw you first. I'm. I'm sorry to everybody else that jumped in. That's like the lux of it. So seven has an exchange there. We're on to a new one. Bids or asks. Ask seven. I'm going hands. Bid six. Bid six. He asked seven. Oh. Asked seven. We can do cents. I'm not doing below cents. Yeah. Six fifty. Bid six seventy five. Nobody has a value less than seven here. I'll close the market. Go ahead. Ask 699. Whoa. <laughs> He's spending a lot. Oh, she took it. All right. Hey, it made a difference. Here we go. All right. So right here, got your differences down. Next, bids or asks. Bids or asks. Yep. Ask 8.5. Yep. Ask 8. Go ahead. Ask 7.5. Right here. Bid five. Sloppy. Don't care. Yep. Bid six. Yes. Got it. Right here. Transaction at six. Here we go. So that was good. So your difference between six and that one. Now you're on to your next one if you haven't made a transaction before. Yep. Bid four. Yep. Ask 10. Bid five, five. Cascade. Yep. Ask seven. Might be money on the line, guys. Yep. Good eight. Uh, that doesn't make sense. So I'm making an exchange there. So that one, who was that one? Who got, got the seven? So you got it for seven. All right. Bids and asks. Money on the line, folks. Yep. Ask eight. What you can. Yep. 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 Here. Bid four. Go ahead. Bid five. Bid six. Ask seven and a half. It's okay. Right here. So those exchange right there from 750. All right, new line, bids and asks. Yep. Ask 12. Yep. Ask 10. Bid five. Ask 750. Ask. Go ahead. All right. Yep. Seven, seven and one. Ask. Uh, uh, ask 701. I'll take 701. And I'm going to go there. <laughs> what happened? Sorry. That's the way it goes. So 701. So Ellie, here, difference between 701. All right. Blame the auctioneer. Yep, go ahead. Nine. Bid six. Go ahead. Go ahead. Eight. Ask yep. seven. Okay, right here, seven. So that was the last exchange right there, right there for seven. Total up your differences and then move on to your next card if you haven't already. You've already moved on. You're done. Yep. Bid 6.5. Yep. Ask 11. Here. Ask 8.5. Yep. Ask 8. Ask 7.75. <laughs> Ask 
Ask 750. Ask 7.4. Bid seven. Ask seven and a quarter. Not a room, guys. All right, she took it. Thank you. Bailed me out there. All right, 725. These last two right there. On to a new one. All right, yep. 13. For what? 13. 13. Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> it's not possible, right? Oh, no, it's above his, right? But no one could take it. Okay, sure. I'll do it. I don't care. Yeah. Three? Three? Yeah, it's 302. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ask 12. Yeah. Ask 9. Yep. Ask 3 10. You can go to <laughs> Six point five. Ask seven and a quarter. He took it. All right. Oh, thank you. Bail me out again. I need to. I need to write smaller. All right. Next one. Bid and ask. Any bid and ask? Yep. Bid five. Yep. Ask twelve. Ask ten. Ask eight. Ask ten point seven five. What is it? Seven point seven thousand. Yep. Six. Ask seven fifty. Six point five. Sold. Right here, seven two five. These two. All right. Uh, new column. Any? Yep. Once we've done our two cards, we can start. Over. Nope, you're done. Once you're done two, you're done. Three four ten. Twelve. More reasonable. <laughs> Five twenty five. Yep. Ask eleven point five. Nine. Ask eight. Five point four. Five point six. Five point seven. Not getting away with it this time, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Five ninety nine. Ask seven point five. Oh, I sort of heard some waffle in his voice, folks. Six. He might he might uh negotiate here. Which way? Uh bid. Ask eight. Ask seven. Ask seven forty five. There's a four there. <laughs> yeah. Ask 7.3. Ask 7. I know what you guys have in your hand now. Ask what? 7.2. 7.2, we're changing it to. 7.01. All right. <laughs> Seven. We'll go for nothing. Yes. Does anybody have a value? Yes, you'll take it. All right, seven sold there. The offer you took. All right, uh, probably this might be it. We'll see. I don't know. Any bids or asks? Yep. You're creative. Yep. Yep. Four bid. Bid five. Ask twelve point four. Five seventy five. 
Yeah. Ask 11. Anybody have asks lower than 11? Yeah. Ask 10.5. Yeah, ask 9.45. 9.1. Values here? Uh, 699. This side? I get that penny. He took it. <laughs> oh. oh, we had two takers. Sorry, I saw him first. All right, so we have that exchange. All right. Uh, bids or asks? Eleven. All right. Yeah. Three two. Three two ten. Three thirty. Uh, ten seventy five. Eight. Three fifteen. Three twenty-five. Three ninety-nine. Like it worked for me last time. Yeah. Oh, didn't work this time. Six. You were just playing hardball. Come on. <laughs> Two hands. Okay. At six, before I had that, so who had the six? Six was sold. Sorry, I didn't see the, the, the cell. He was waving me down. He's in the back. Sorry. So that got a six and a six. So what your difference is there? All right, bids or asks? Yep. Five. Six. Yep. Okay. Yep. Eight. Yep. 9.5. Small number now. Yep. Five point five. Six. Sorry. Ask seven. Sale at seven. These are asks. Good time. Asking, should do it. Six and a half. Any values over six point five? Are costs under eight? Yep. Seven point nine. Ask seven point five. Seven point four. Seven point two five. <laughs> Never know. The point two five might lead to twenty five percent on test one bonus points. Probably won't, but it might. We don't know. Any values over six fifty or costs under seven twenty five? Shut down the market. If you don't make an exchange, you don't get anything from it. Yep. Market closes in five. Yep. 720. <laughs> Big change. He's on the board, though. <laughs> Market closes in five, four, three, two, 
one. Did not have a transaction here. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen transactions that took place. Fourteen transactions. Can somebody average up all of the circles? Is it fifteen? Will somebody average the circles that are up here? All right, here's where you're going to help me out. This is going to, we're going to have to kind of go quick here and get this done. I am going to have the suppliers. Yellows? Yellows, you're going to come up to this side of the room first. You're going to get a little piece of tape because my post-it notes aren't sticky enough, and you're going to put a little piece of tape on your sticky note, and I'm going to have you come up in order. So I'm going to have the ones come up first and hand me your ones, and I'm going to post them on the board so we can get a little picture of what's happening here, all right? So all my yellows are going to be up here. Pinks, stay seated. Yellows with ones, get the tape first and then thereafter. You're going to end up handing me all of both of your pieces. So I'm gonna say ones first. You gotta hang around until you get rid of like the threes and the fours and the fives or whatever all there is. Okay. Actually, I didn't have ones and twos, right? Um I think it didn't start at three. Yeah. So yellows, come on up here. If you have a three or a four, get to the tape first. And everybody come up here, get pieces of tape on there. So you're going to hand it to me and we're going to go. Threes is in particular. Come hand me if you have a three. No, you're going to hand it to me. I'm going to go stand up there because we're going to have to. Hold on. I didn't realize I did two. Yeah, I never other twos, threes. So everybody get tape on theirs now in advance so I can go fast. Otherwise, it's going to take me a long time. Threes, other threes, fours. I got to at least have one. Somebody's got to have a four. Yeah. You broke the tape. These old peats. Fives. I have a four as well. Oh, you have a four. Fours. Fives. Other fives, sixes. You have to do no labor here. Figure it out. Other sixes. Any other sixes? Sevens. Oh, a bunch of sevens. Lucky seven. <laughs> Feeling good about that one. Oh, jeez. Got, got a little carried away with seven. Eight. Nines. Tens, elevens. Sorry about your luck. Twelves. Really sorry. All right, we're good. Our right, pinks come up here. Same thing. I'm gonna start with uh, the twelve, though. The 12s get to the tape first. Somebody else help them get pieces of tape. Any other 12s? Everybody's 12. Oh, man. 
So it's going to sometimes make the outcomes a little funky here. Think about that. Do the smallest pieces you can then. 11s. Ends. <laughs> tens, nines. Other nines. Eight. Oh, a little bit of my. Eights. Yes. All right. Sevens. <laughs> Sixes. <laughs> Sixes. Fives. Any other fives? Fours. Sorry about your luck. And threes. Really sorry about your luck. Does everybody see what we just did here? I, mean, I think it like sticks out at you in your face. This is a supply and demand graph. Right? What was the average price? 6.88. If you were to, if I were to have done this in advance and gave you guys these numbers and then put into an envelope before the class started the price $7. And then took you through this experiment and said, do you think there's any way I could have predicted the price that occurred from this mess of you guys like coming up with strategies and being like 1250, 1199, 602, right? I mean, that was a mess, right? And I basically could have gotten the price right. Is there any way to do that? You would have thought there's no way, there's no, there's no like magic trick you can do. I didn't even set it up in advance. I let you pick numbers. But I could have, with those numbers, came to the price of seven, right? And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, 15 transactions, which I could have predicted between 14 and 17 transactions. Usually you come up one or two short because in these markets, we haven't had much experience in it. You don't know what the prices are at first. So there's some kind of crazy haggling going on at first. Like these were like legitimate bids early on, like these high numbers, you're like, maybe, I don't know, right? And so we get some weird transactions that take place. And sometimes we come up a little bit short, right? So what we ended up with here though, was price was equal to, what do we say, 688? And quantity was 15 transactions, which was basically right here on this guy. That's freaking amazing. Like this is relatively small numbers. We had almost no information other than you knew it was between three and 12. You did not know the supply schedule of all the suppliers out there. You didn't know the demand schedule of all the demanders out there. The reality is, is that a lot of demanders wouldn't have funky demand curves too. Like, oh, I valued at 12 and then two you know, or whatever, things like that. Like there are some of you guys on these extremes. When you have a lot higher number of buyers and sellers, what do we end up with? We end up with a lot more kind of in noise in this situation, which compresses the numbers down really, really quickly. Like none of you guys, when you were over here, really thought that this was going to hit. You're like, I'm going to throw it out there hoping, but you didn't think it was going to hit. And you didn't think this was going to hit either. But it was like, well, 
let's see. You know, I can always bid lower, but I can always ask lower or whatever, you know, like going through that. When we do supply and demand, what I my goal of this class is to get you to see the individual action of just normal people behind the scenes of it. There is nothing in what we did today that is going to help you study for test one. <laughs> there's zero, there's not going to be like a well, did you value it at seven? Question. But I think today is probably like the most valuable exercise to go through in all of part one to understand and appreciate supply and demand. It is not a graph that is just a graph in a book. It is representing real people and real people's actions. All we needed was the rule of rational life. And we got this answer here. Vernon Smith, who went on to win a Nobel Prize in economics, who developed the field of experimental economics, first ran this experiment in a classroom back in like the 1950s. And he was doing it, just like I said I was doing, to showcase to his principles of micro students how we need all of these assumptions of the model to make markets work. And he didn't have any of the assumptions and he got the right answer. And he was like, well, shoot, I was trying to show how it won't happen unless I like reveal some information and stuff like that. So he thought it was a fluke. So he changed the demand and supply so they were like way more elastic and it still worked. Then he did smaller numbers. He had like eight people in the room. So an hour ago, I did it with smaller numbers. We got the right price and we were two transactions short. He got the right price in one transaction short. It's like, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 right? It's like fairly foolproof in going through kind of a double auction setting, which you might say, well, that's kind of, you know, when do you ever do a double auction? Oh, I don't know, like the New York Stock Exchange. Like that's how it essentially is done is you can put forward bids and asks like this. This isn't like some contrived system. He went to how are markets kind of set in these kind of, in the in real world situations. We can predict what happens here. So what Vernon would do is he would put in an envelope the price and the quantity, but he would then before class prepare the demand schedules and the supply schedules so he can know what the answer is and hand it out to him and then have somebody open up the envelope and be like, oh my gosh, you like got it right. Okay. I showed it to you because a lot of times students feel like that's a magic trick, like it was contrived, like it was set up somehow or something like that. I did it differently with you guys where I just made the numbers up in front of you didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew we'd get close to, to the equilibrium point because it's just you responding to your own incentives. It's a crazy thing. Post class, you're going to do the other half of this class. This is the experimental side to appreciate it. Post class, you're going to do the mathematical side of things. You're going to take this pink and the end curve here, and you're going to turn it into algebraic kind of functional form. And you're going to take the supply curve and turn it into functional form. And then you're going to do some math with it. So I'll show you guys just really quickly the video that you guys have for post class. I'll show you the slides that you have for it. But you're just learning the mathematical representation of the real world that we just did of individuals acting. You're going to just do basic algebra with the supply and demand function. And what you're going to do is you're going to follow four basic steps to solve these equations. Okay, so I'm just previewing this. This is all on a video spelled out for you guys. It's going through these slides. It's going to ask you about supply and demand curves. It's going to set up a problem. Say demand is this equation. This is going to look something like that. And supply is this equation, which is just at a price of one, a quantity is one, and price of two, a quantity is two. That's what that equation means. It's going to look something upward sloping. And then it's going to walk through how you go through the algebra here, okay? And that's gonna have another, a second question for you. It's gonna walk through the algebra that you have here. But what I wanna send you guys off with is something that I want to transmit to you. Maybe you can't learn as easily from the textbook or the video. Do my four-step process. As good as you are at math, do this anyway, okay? So later on, this setup, is going to help us with more slightly complex problems. So you're gonna see other ways to solve this. You're gonna be like, oh, I don't know what's happening here. Just do these four steps. So the first one is get standard supply and demand equations, which just means set both equation up, both of the equations up equal to Q. When we have Q equals, we call that our standard supply function or Q equals, we have our standard demand function. If it's P equals, 
That's what we call our inverse demand function or our inverse supply function. So we're gonna set them both up equal to Q. So we're gonna have our supply function up equal to Q and our demand equal to Q. And then we know in equilibrium, quantity supplied has to equal quantity demanded. If you have two equations where they have Q equals, you can smush them together and get rid of the Qs, right? Because you're gonna have Q equals this and Q equals that. It means both those things have to be equal to one another. So that's step two. You set them up equal to Q, then you smush them together. Then you solve for the remaining variable, which is price. And now that you have price, you plug it back into these original equations and you solve for quantity. Very easy. Okay, but follow this process. Don't do P equals and then smush the equations together. It's gonna come back, back to bite you later on. So do the standard supply and demand functions, Q equals, smush them together, solve for price, and then plug it back in. All right? All right, we'll get you guys out of here if you guys.